All right, hey guys, it's your tired teacher again, and I am here on Sunday night. I was feeling like hell this weekend, but um, yeah, show must go on. So let's go ahead and talk about some reconstruction today, and hopefully my voice will carry on. All right, where we left off last time, guys, was with the Civil War and the aftermath of the Civil War. So here's what we're talking about. We're talking so many dead from this war. I mean, when you think about it, looking at comparing the Civil War to other wars we've been in, nothing comes close. I mean, you add everything up together, still will not equal the casualties of the Civil War. Speaking of casualties, let's go back to the previous slide here. We've got 365,000 Union dead, 265,000 Confederate dead, 375,000 either injured or wounded, most likely amputations in that category. One in 15 adult males were war casualties, so that's going to take out a sizable chunk of the male population in the United States, especially in the Confederacy. Large sections of the South were devastated. Whatever industry and rail yards that they had were pretty much destroyed by Sherman and his march. 11 former Confederate states need to be restored because, I mean, let's face it, they are looking super tore up. I mean, that's a Confederacy post-Civil War. And plus, there's this thing of the newly freed, newly freedmen, okay? People who used to be slaves. It's 4 million. Now, with no place to go, no money, no jobs no education. They're free. So we need to figure out what to do, not only with rebuilding the South, repairing the Union, but what to do with the freedmen. So here's our answer. Reconstruction. So when we talk about Reconstruction, we're generally referring to the era post-Civil War. It's from 1865 to 1877. And we're doing just that. We are rebuilding the nation. It's Physically, politically, I mean, economically, all of that. So our biggest issues, how do we rebuild this nation? Like, how is this nation going to be reunited? Because, I mean, war did its damage to, our, to the relations between the North and the South. What's going to replace the labor system in the South? Because, I mean, the labor system was slavery, but now that's out of the question thanks to the passage of the 13th Amendment. And what should the status of these former slaves be? Should we allow equal protection or just end it at like, hey, you're free? Should we allow these freedmen the right to vote? These are questions we gotta answer. So, the South's economy is devastated by the Civil War. I mean, Remember, cotton was king down south. That was their main export, but since he took away the labor source of the south by freeing the slaves with the 13th Amendment, you know, the southern economy is just tanking. It, it's, you can see in this graph right here, it's like cut in half, right? Within 10 years, it's like cut in half. Though northern economy is growing, and that's because we've entered a second industrial age, which is the Gilded Age, um, but we'll talk about that more with the next unit. But for now, let's go ahead and talk about what kind of opened the doors with this, the 13th Amendment. So just remember, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. What we mean by abolished we means get rid of it. No more, okay? So no more slavery. So this is passed in 1865, and Lincoln was still alive to see this one. However, you know, um, we would have subsequent amendments post this. This would be part of our Reconstruction Amendments. The job is not done yet. We still need to figure out what to do with the Freedmen, now that they're free. So here's where the Freedmen's Bureau comes in. So the Freedmen's Bureau is a governmental institution, um, well, rather, bureaucratic institution of the government. 
and it's officially known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. This is established by the War Department in March of 1865 because they already saw the writing on the wall. They knew the Confederacy was already losing, so we're already kind of figuring out plans like how to reconstruct the nation and what to do with the Freedmen. So the Freedmen's Bureau's job was to provide relief and educational activities to these Freedmen. Um, you know, issuing out rations, clothing, medicine, providing a means for education, hospitals, like all of that falls under the Freedmen's Bureau. And since this is governed by the War Department, um, you're gonna have, you know, the army in charge of this, pretty much. So, um, the Freedmen's Bureau Act is the one that sets up the Freedmen's Bureau. It's in March of 1865, like we said. This one's developed, and the guy in charge is Oliver O. Howard. He's the commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, and you can see him in his Union uniform right there. I mean, come on, military dude. So, Subsequently, Howard University, which is a historic all-black college, is named after this guy. And rightfully so. The Freedmen's Bureau did advance education to the freedmen. So, um, what the Freedmen's Bureau is going to do is divide up the ex-Confederacy into ten districts. Y yeah, it's not Hunger Games, guys, but <laughs> anyways, uh, Texas was part of District 5. So, um, each district is going to have a commissioner appointed, so again, the bureaucratic chain is established, and um, one of the first things that they try to do is settle the freedmen on acres of abandoned and confiscated con ex-Confederate land, okay? Uh, but there's going to be a halt to this. This was ended up being stopped by the president, not by Lincoln, but by the next president, President Johnson, and um, the land was given back to its former Confederate owners. So there goes that idea. But uh, the Freedmen's Bureau will also like help to negotiate contracts between the freed people and, you know, the ex-plantation class of the South to negotiate like wages for in exchange for their labor. But there's, um, there's some shenanigans going on here, not with the Freedmen's Bureau, but with the members of the ex-Confederacy. So, um, you're going to see people subverting the system with um, contract labor styles of like sharecropping, tenant farming, and it's going to kind of defeat the purpose. But that's a little while later, and we'll see why. So, just keep that thought. But really, the big things that the Freedmen's Bureau does is give food to the Freedmen, medical care, you know, establish the schools, um, supervise those labor contracts, managing that abandoned and confiscated land, and also settling court disputes. So, really, if we're looking at this political cartoon here, the Freedmen Bureau is there to keep the peace, and help the freedmen, and in a way also kind of like defend them off from like the angry racist white mob here, <laughs> okay? Acting as that buffer between what things used to be like and what things are in the future. So probably the biggest accomplishment of the Freedmen's Bureau was the schools that it set up. Because I mean, think about it. You've got a large free population now, 4 million people who generally don't know how to read and write, because that kind of thing was forbidden to be taught in the South. So, you're going to see mixed schools. You're going to see old grandpas and grandmas learning how to read with their young, like, grandchildren. Um, you're going to have people volunteer to be teachers at these Freedmen Bureau schools, mainly, you know, ex-abolitionists um, will come down south and volunteer to teach at these schools. And, I mean, yeah, the classrooms are going to be multi-level. 
because like we said uh, you got various age ranges in here and you can see there I mean in this class in particular in this image you see women learning basic like life skills like how to sew like things like that um, but you would learn reading writing you know vocational training that kind of stuff so reading and writing of course was going to be the most significant thing that the freedmen will learn and i mean with that opens the doors to education right so usually what your freedman bureau school would look like would be this one room log cabin style school <laughs> it, it's not as creepy as this guys i know this looks like something out of a horror movie but really no nah, it's it's a bit better So, <laughs> really inside is more like this. You see the multi-age range of people learning how to read and write. And so, what the Freedmen's Bureau is going to end up establishing is over 4,000 elementary schools, over 9,000 teachers are going to be employed, you know, over 247,000 pupils taught, 74 high school and normal schools were built, um, normal schools being the teacher training schools, and 61 industrial schools were built. So I mean, really, education is opening up to the freedmen. Other accomplishments. Well, 21 million food rations are given out to both black and poor white southerners, because remember, um, you know, poor whites actually did suffer as well majority of them did not own slaves so um freedom's bureau will extend out that olive branch to them 45 hospitals um are going to be established and they treat over 450,000 patients they settle about 30,000 displaced persons people who were kicked off the plantation so they're being resettled um negotiating thousands of labor contracts becoming the arbiter and mediating disputes, and then of course the 4,300 schools, right? So this program, however, comes to a halt very quickly because it is a very expensive program. And so by 1869, the Freedmen's Bureau um, will start coming to an end and by 1870 the operations will cease so yeah it's a good start but dude money talks and this country was like nope too expensive it's good for a while but we're not going to continue this so uh this is under president johnson he's the one who really you know tries to stop the freedmen's hero President Lincoln, when he was still alive, he had a drastically, well, not really drastically different program. President Lincoln was very lenient with his program. His program was a proposed 10% plan. He had come up with this in 1863, probably post Gettysburg, all right? I'm not sure the exact date though, but um, this is what he plans to do. He wants to offer a pardon to all supporters of the Confederacy if they swear their allegiance to the Union and pledged to end slavery, okay? When 10% of the voting men do that in each state, they're free to come back into the Union. But they also have to adopt a new constitution, which says no more slavery, and that's it. There's like no added protection for the freedmen, just nothing. It's just, hey, our bad, okay, we promise not to have slavery, here it is, it's written in our constitution, good to go. Dude, this is a freaking lenient plan. But <laughs> President Lincoln was shot and killed. We remember. I mean, come on now. We we remember he was shot and killed. There was the big conspirators ring, right? And Lincoln wasn't the only one targeted. He was also Secretary of State William Seward. And yeah. One last time to see the picture. <laughs> but anyways, um so yeah, this guy did a terrible thing. Okay. But anyways, Secretary of State William Seward survives his attack, and the conspirators are captured. 
um, Lincoln, you know, ends up dying along the way on April 15th, 1865. Conspirators are hung and President Johnson enters the scene because he was vice president under Lincoln. So let's go back to this previous slide and look at President Johnson's plan for reconstruction. President Johnson's plan is kind of like Lincoln's. I mean, it's really like lenient like that, but he goes a step further. He's going to offer amnesty to whites who sign loyalty oaths, which means like he's going to kind of like say things are good with them again. That's why a lot of them get their confiscated lands back. I mean, it's going to be like a clean freaking slate. But he does agree that slavery must be abolished in the states. Uh, the states got to pay their war debt, but no protections for the freedmen, no right to vote for the freedmen. I mean, done. So Congress and President Johnson are going to butt heads over this. I mean, President Johnson continuously vetoes bills, um, like to extend the Freedmen's Bureau. He's going to also um, have the southern states are going to take advantage of his easy approach. They're going to, ex-Confederates are going to like rule again pretty much, take control of their state governments, and you know things are bad when you get like former Confederates in public office. I mean, that's that's a terrible thing. So, uh, this is another thing that happens under President Johnson's plan. Um, the Black Codes were established, which basically it'd be like if you took the old rules and old laws of slavery from prior to the Civil War and got rid of the word slave and replaced it with apprentice. That's what these laws were. Black codes. So, basically, freemen were required to enter into labor contracts. And if they didn't enter into the labor contract, they were thrown in jail. And forced to work anyways. Dependent children were forced into apprenticeships and their masters could whip them if they didn't obey. Unemployed blacks were considered vagrants and they could be sold into private service if they didn't pay their fines. Well, these people have no money. How are they gonna pay their fines? So what you see here is the selling off of a man because he couldn't pay his fines. Dude, this looks like a slave auction. Seriously. And this is 1867. This is post-Civil War, post-13th Amendment. And if you're thrown in jail because of vagrancy, you're in a chain gang. You see the chains around these guys' ankles? It's freaking slavery. Freaking slavery. So really, one must ask the question, is slavery truly dead by this point? In the eyes of many, it wasn't. It was just called something different. So, punishment was harsh back then. I mean, they would still do public whippings. They would still have people hanging out in the stocks under President Johnson's rule. And like we were saying, these people got away with it because of the leniency of President Johnson's plan. Ex-Confederates took over the government positions in the state. You've got four ex-Confederate generals elected, six ex-Confederate cabinet members are elected, 58 ex-Confederate congressmen elected, and the former vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevenson right there, was freaking elected to the Senate from Georgia. I'm sorry, <laughs> we're not supposed to have these people in charge of federal government. <sighs> yeah, Johnson's presidency for Reconstruction so far is a fail. Because really, what the nation kind of sees at this point, especially, you know, people who, who look at all of these things, I mean, to them, it looks like this is a white man's government. 
You could see the freedmen down there at the bottom, being stepped on by the wealthy capitalist of the North. The Confederate member right here in the middle, and for some reason, uh, a really racist looking Irish dude. <laughs> Uh, caricature right there in the left. Well, because remember, immigrants in big cities were anti freeing the slaves, so I guess that kind of makes sense. Because of the job competition. But, anyways, they're all stepping on this dude. He's trying to reach for the ballot box, can't reach it. There's people lynched in the background, you know, orphan asylums and southern schools burning in the background. I mean, it's like insane. And what's written up here, a vote on this guy's shillelagh, which is his club. Uh, the Lost Cause, written on this guy's dagger right here, or knife. And then it says capital, which is basically his wallet. Money, okay? So yeah, I mean, this is kind of like what we see. Plus, around this time, the KKK is rising up in power. They're starting to threaten and harass people. Um... And not just the freedmen, but people who help them out too. Like people who run the Freedmen Bureau schools. They are constantly attacked by these people. The person who starts up the KKK is going to be General Nathan Bedford Forrest. And I mean, yeah, they hang out in robes and stuff and just harass and target and spread violence and fear amongst the freedmen. Because I mean... If you were exercising your rights and going against the grain of Southern society at this time, they would threaten you with lynching. Beatings. I mean, it's just a terrible, terrible thing. So, like we said, uh, Congress is going to really butt heads with President Johnson. Because he even, like, vetoes... Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, Congress overrides his presidential veto. Uh, and, you know, this Civil Rights Act is going to uh, try to, like, outline the rights of citizens, including the right to enter contracts, sue, give evidence in court, property rights. And then Congress is going to try to submit the 14th Amendment. President Johnson tries to get the southern state legislatures to vote against it. The 14th Amendment is going to extend citizenship rights to all males in this country. Um, females still got to fight a little bit. Um, but, well, it's to basically all native-born people, but really it's implied as males at that time. Women will get rights a bit later. But, with this election of 1866 at the midterms, um, Congress is going to take control. Congress gains a super majority, essentially, a two-thirds majority of both houses of Congress, so they have enough to override the presidential veto, which gives the radical Republicans the in that they wanted to really transform the nation through Reconstruction. So we're talking about people like Thaddeus Stevens, Edwin Stanton, Sam and Chase. They're motivated by stuff like revenge. They want to punish the South for the war. Uh, they do have genuine concern for the freedmen. I mean, these guys are the radical, the radical Republicans, so they want to push for stuff like voting rights as well, and equal protection. And they want to make sure that um, the Republicans keep their power in the South, because they're not dumb. They know that giving the vote to the freedmen will ensure the Republicans stay in power. So, there's going to be a big battle between you know, radical Republicans and the president. So after, you know, passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the extension of the Freedmen's Bureau, um, you know, this is the first time that Congress has ever overrid the presidential veto. So this is a big freaking deal. Now with that first Reconstruction Act, um, that's going to be passed in March of 1867. It's overridden um, President Johnson's veto on this. And essentially, you know, now the South is divided up into five districts, military districts, and they're going to establish martial law. This right here, we go back to our Reconstruction slide, 
is the beginnings of radical reconstruction. Okay, so radical reconstruction was instituted by the Republicans, and this is what they want. They want all of the above, but push it a step further. They want equal rights for the freedmen. They want the military to occupy the South to make sure that these rights are ensured to the freedmen. They want voting rights for African American males. So essentially the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, they want these adopted by the southern states, put in their constitutions, before they even think about letting them back into the Union. So, this is where things kind of get dicey, because, you know, having, having the military occupy your home, well not your house like home, but like your home area, it's kind of a scary thing for the South. Um, so it does cause some tension, but this is to ensure the protection and safety of the freedmen, because remember, KKK be running around. So as long as the troops are there, things are kind of kept peaceful. It's not perfect, but it's better than what it would be if they weren't there. So like we were saying, the Southern states had to adopt the 14th Amendment, um, make sure that no ex-Confederate holds public office, and they had to guarantee the freedmen the right to vote. So these five military districts, like I was talking about before, we are District 5, and um, you know, the freedmen are going to show up to vote. 700,000 are going to be registered to vote. and. So, Congress is going to pass uh, another Reconstruction Bill in July of 1867, again overriding President Johnson's veto, granting the military district commanders the power to remove the state officials from office. Remember those ex-Confederates. So, in March of 1868, there's a fourth Reconstruction Act that's going to propose that the state constitutions be ratified by a simple majority in the states, and they've got to include the amendments, right? The 13th, 14th, and 15th. So here's where things finally get to a head. Remember, impeachment was not <laughs> done to President Andrew Jackson, but it is done to President Andrew Johnson. Here's what happens. In March of 1867, uh, they passed the Tenure of Office Act, which uh, restricts presidential power to remove Edwin Stanton as a Secretary of State. So when Johnson fires Edwin Stanton, he's violating that Tenure of Office Act. It's a technicality, basically. So in February of 1867, the House is going to move the Articles of Impeachment. They're going to vote to impeach President Johnson. And impeachment has two steps, guys. Step number one, the House votes on it. And it's the formal, like, oh yeah, you're impeached. Bad mark on the record books. It's the second step. The Senate step where you get into big trouble. This is the one that kicks you out of office. And President Johnson avoided being kicked out of office by one vote. So, dude, this came close. But anyways, this is the first impeachment you know, that we've had in U.S. history. So yeah, people are going to be like, hey, here's your golden ticket. Check out the impeachment. <laughs> I mean, uh. but anyways, it's a big deal. And uh, now that President Johnson's out of the way, uh, we're going to have a new election, which is going to be the election of 1868. So uh, he starts out the rest of his term because remember, he didn't go through step two. The, the Senate. So in step two, it's a trial. Uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice is the one presiding over the trial. The senators are the jury. And like we said, it was one vote that prevented his, um, you know, being charged and kicked out. So in 1868, the Republican Party decides to run a war hero, Ulysses S. Grant. I mean, he, he won the Civil War for the Union, so yeah, he's, he's pretty popular up there. 
But uh, <laughs> even though he's a good dude, deep down, he's got kind of a sordid um, attitude about... Well, he drinks a lot. <laughs> okay, just put it out there. <laughs> he drinks a whole lot and he surrounds himself around shady friends. You guys all have that friend who's like a good person but surrounds himself around shady people. That's President Grant, <laughs> okay? Does not keep the best of company, even though the dude himself is all right. His company, really shady. So what the Republican Party is doing with this election is that they're like, yeah, this guy's a war hero. And they're waving this proverbial bloody shirt, which basically is like, oh yeah, remember the Democrats started this war. That's pretty much what they're doing with waving the bloody shirt essentially. So, um, this is gonna be won in part thanks to the vote of the freedmen. I mean, come on, let's face it, the southern states down there that are, that are for grants? Yeah, the freedmen are the ones who voted in. You guys notice there are green states, right? Those states hadn't been uh, let into the Union yet. So let's get, let's get back here because I've got a funny story about one of them. Notice Mississippi. Okay, um, did you guys know that Mississippi barely outlawed slavery in um, 2014? 2013? Whenever the movie Lincoln came out. <laughs> no joke, look this up. Uh, so apparently when Reconstruction ended Mississippi hadn't put that in their state constitution yet. <laughs> and because Reconstruction ended, they're kind of like, hey, come on back in, Mississippi. Just all no problem. So, <laughs> ah, in the 90s, they caught the mistake. They're like, oh, hey, we hadn't um, uh, put in the 13th Amendment yet in our state constitution. So, uh, yeah, how about we fix that? <laughs> it took them until the 2000s to fix it and they fixed it because they felt guilty after watching the movie Lincoln because that movie is all about President Lincoln and the radical Republicans trying to pass the 13th Amendment. Bro, <laughs> I know you guys procrastinate but you're not as bad as Mississippi outlawing slavery. <laughs> I am not kidding you guys. This is a true story. Look it up. But anyways, <laughs> I digress. Let's move on. So Grant wins, right? He won the popular vote by only about 300,000, but thanks to those 700,000 votes cast by the freedmen, he wins. And this shows the Republican Party, hey, we need to ensure that the freedmen have the right to vote down south because that is what's going to help us win. So that's what this political cartoon shows. It shows the freedmen voting for Grant. Um, this is a Thomas Nass cartoon. He's going to be a famous political cartoonist, but we'll see more of his cartoons when we talk about the Gilded Age. So President Grant's got some scandals going on during his presidency. <laughs> Like I said, he surrounds himself around shady people. <laughs> shady people. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we got the Black Friday scandal involving Jim Fisk and Jay Gould, which we'll talk about during the Gilded Age, as well as the Credit Mobilier scandal, which we'll talk about during the Gilded Age. The Whiskey Ring scandal, which I think involved President Grant's son, brother-in-law? Or brother? I uh, one of the two. And then the Belknap bribery scandal. So, I mean, yeah. Grant, not a bad guy. His his squad, really shady. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Grant did do a couple of good things during his presidency, though. I mean, you know, 15th Amendment's passed. He tries to do the Enforcement Act. Um, he tries to pass the KKK Act so that you know, you're act actively going after the KKK. He's elected to two terms, and um, the second term, though, the Democrats won control of both houses of Congress, so there's gridlock, and not gets not much gets done uh, in that second part. So it's kind of like 
Reconstruction is starting to lose its steam a bit. Um, but the big victories, the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. So the 14th Amendment grants equal protection and citizenship to all people born in the country. And uh, the 15th Amendment gives all men the right to vote. Hold up, no. <laughs> Women be fighting for suffrage for the right to vote already. Seneca Falls has been going on a couple decades now. You know, well, the, the women's rights movement and the push for suffrage has been going on for a couple of decades now. Seneca Falls happened back in 1848, so what the hell? What happened? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is where the women's rights movement takes a racist turn. Ugh, okay. So, remember at Seneca Falls, you had abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass saying, yeah, women need the right to vote. <sighs> when it comes to passage of the 15th Amendment, Frederick Douglass is one that kind of uh, changes his mind. And um, he says, you know what? Now is the Negro hour. Uh, and he... He says, yeah, women, you can wait because your husbands can vote for you. The people who should have the right to vote are African Americans because their lives literally depend on it. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony are going to be like, what the hell? Uh, so the women's rights movement splits in two. Half thinking, you know what, Frederick Douglass is right. We can hold off a little bit. The other half are like, Oh, hell no. Uh, this is some crap. We're going to start getting racist up here and be like, hey, white men, <laughs> you want to ensure that white power is here to stay? Let white women vote. Yeah, dude. The women's rights movement actually went there. <laughs> Not a proud moment for women's suffrage. At all. But, um, yeah, the movement's gonna be split for a while. They come back together again towards the end of the century. But for now, eh, we got some. Yeah, we got some drama. But alright, more drama coming at you with the Redeemer governments. So, the Redeemer governments. Are these governments that are part of the Democratic Party back then? Remember, the Democrats back then are not the Democrats now. The parties flip. Just like the Republicans back then are not the Republicans now. The parties flip. Okay? Disclaimer. But anyways, the Redeemers um, are kind of like trying to bring back this whole like white only, you know, back to the way things were kind of thing. So they're replacing the Republican elected people in state Congress and uh, they're trying to make things the way they were pre-Reconstruction. So a lot of the protections that the freedmen had, they're trying to get rid of them. So really, I mean, what we see is worse than slavery. We got the KKK joining forces with the White League and you could see the poor Friedman family right there suffering. The schoolhouse has been burned. Their kid is dead. He's holding a, a book. And you could see a lynching in the background, so I mean. The captions, the lost cause, the union as it was. This is a white man's government. So really, you know, it's, this is scary times for the Friedman. Because, I mean, look at this image right here. You could just be like straight up at home getting dinner ready. And here's the KKK creeping on in, shooting people. It's a freaking scary time. So that's why Congress is prompted to pass like the Enforcement Acts, right? To try to get rid of like this whole like KKK violence and stuff. But it's kind of like too little too late. Uh, 
the Enforcement Acts are supposed to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendment. The KKK Act is supposed to, you know, combat the KKK. Like we said, it's kind of too little too late because by now the Redeemer governments have already had a foothold in Southern politics and they're going to win. They're going to win. But as far as the African American experience during Reconstruction, it, it kind of varies. You're going to have some positives and negatives. One big positive is that the African American community is going to come together and they're going to unite in meeting halls like this. They're going to reunite with their loved ones because now they have the freedom to travel all across the South because their loved ones could have been sold off to like another, another plantation. So they have that authority now to go search out their loved ones and they do. They also have the authority now to get married because that even was forbidden under slavery. So uh, the black church will be at the forefront of, you know, the black community at this time. The black church is going to be seen as not only spiritual, but for community oriented activities, for social activities, and just, you know, to keep up spirits and whatnot. The black church members come together and worship and, you know, talk. Um, black ministers are going to have a powerful role amongst the black community because they are figureheads. So it's no coincidence that later on, when we talk about the civil rights era of the 1960s, the black churches are at the forefront. I mean, come on, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He's a reverend, part of the black church, leader, right? So same kind of deal. Though black churches are targeted for violence, much like they were in the 1960s. Black colleges are also set up too. I mean, we have Howard University, Fisk University, the Tuskegee Institute. So we have African Americans learning, you know, technical and trade skills and getting advanced degrees now. So this is definitely going to propel the black community in the right direction. Now, a negative though is the economics of the era. So like we said, the South is really suffering economically because the labor source is basically not there anymore, right? So there are ways that Southern society circumvents the protections of the freedmen. And how they do this is not only with cooperation of the Redeemer government, but uh, you know, those black codes and what we'll have later on, which will be Jim Crow laws. So really ex-plantation owners take advantage of the situation. They know that their former slaves have no place to go. So they kind of uh, say, hey, yeah. You know you have no place to go. How about you stay on this land and you farm the land for us? Uh, and to pay off your rent, you give us a share of your crops. That's sharecropping. So essentially the share of your crops would be so much to where you'd barely break even. So essentially it's like legal slavery. Same thing with tenant farming. It's like, hey, you got no place to stay. You can farm here, <laughs> um, we'll even let you borrow our farm equipment, but you got to pay us a certain amount each month and you got to rent the equipment from us and you got to pay us for that too. So essentially breaking even, it's legalized slavery. And then you would have like these chain gangs also, uh, well these gang systems and This gang work model is um, going to not work, um, you know, the overseer still like saw them and still kept a watchful eye on the freedmen. 
the blacks are going to resist the gang work model um, at first, so that's why the sharecropping and tenant farming come around. And really, I mean, this type of system with the sharecropping and tenant farming keep African Americans basically at rock bottom. Like, they've got no upward mobility and income whatsoever. And remember, if they fought against the system, the KKK was there to enforce it with violence. So people were afraid to like fight back. So I mean, the system is going to stick around for a while. Now, with politics, even though we do have, um, you know, former slaves given the right to vote and hold public office and such, um, and we do have some black politicians. I mean, you know, we do have several congressmen, both at the state and national level, you know, Secretary of State, you know, um, Speaker of the House, like, big offices here. But this is going to be short-lived, again, because as long as the troops are there, this can happen, but once that protection is taken away, their power is going to diminish. So, um, it's going to be a big power struggle between the Democrats in the South and the Republican, the Radical Republicans. So, we already know which way the Black Republicans vote. They're, um, they vote for a Republican Party because, well, yeah, it's the party of Lincoln. I mean, party that granted these rights to them. But their vote is going to often be diminished in the South. Um, you're going to see instances where they're going to be threatened with violence. Um, you're going to see a bunch of like dudes with shotguns around the polling place. You're going to see ballots being lost or miscounted. A lot of the crazy shenanigans go on. Uh, people taking advantage of the southern economy at this time would be carpetbaggers and scalawags. Carpetbaggers are people from the north coming down south to take advantage of the cheap real estate from the confiscated lands um, and the economic opportunity. Southerners really hate these people. They especially hate scalawags, who are former confederates who basically do the same thing, like General James Longstreet and uh, Calvary Officer Mulby right here, Mosby right here. So they kind of see them as like turncoats and traitors. But Reconstruction um, is winding down already. People are really, really just tired of Reconstruction. Even up north. I mean, there was so much gusto at the beginning for Reconstruction, but now, in the 1870s, especially after the economic depression of the 1870s, 1873, um, that people were just like, you know what, won't got the money for Reconstruction, it's expensive, and really... People were just thinking about <laughs> cooler places out in the nation at that time in their imagination, which would be the West. You know, cowboys, the Plains Wars against Native Americans, gunslinging, all of that. People were like, yeah, the West. So Reconstruction comes to an end in 1876 with the presidential election of Rutherford B. Hayes over Samuel Tilden. Now, there was a tie again in um, the electoral college so it had to go to the house and it came down to southern democrats and votes so they made a deal they're like hey republican party you guys want your boy as president then you guys better end some reconstruction so that's the deal the republican party is like yeah we want the presidency so they swapped reconstruction for the presidency and the Compromise of 1877 seals the deal. Hayes is elected president. Reconstruction is officially over. And because we got Reconstruction over, troops have to withdraw. And when they withdraw, that's when the big problem starts. And the protections of the freedmen are pretty much no more. So, even though the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are the major, major, you know, 
accomplishments of reconstruction. Uh, reconstruction is kind of a failure because towards the end, you know, after reconstruction, it's kind of like a return of the old without that government enforcement by the military or like any strict rules and the redeemer government's coming in charge again. It's hard to get the freedmen to have any rights. So the Supreme Court doesn't help either with this court case Plessy versus Ferguson. So Homer Plessy um, is a black man. He tried to board the train, a white only train to Louisiana and um, he was forcibly removed and jailed. He said, hey, I've got rights. 13th and 14th Amendment makes me a citizen and I get equal protection. So therefore I should board this white train. The Supreme Court says no. <laughs> the Supreme Court says, uh, did they have a separate but equal um, black train car? Because if they did, then yeah, you don't go in the white train car. And their notion of separate but equal is like, it just has to be a train car, <laughs> not necessarily equal in every single way for it to be considered separate but equal. So essentially think about it like this. Like, okay, like our restrooms at school are nice, right? But if you go to other schools in our district <laughs> and think about their restrooms, they're not as nice. But according to stuff like Plessy versus Ferguson, that would be considered separate but equal. It's still a restroom. The condition doesn't matter. So we're gonna have like so much inequality going on in the country from basically now in 1870, you know, 1883 with Plessy versus Ferguson till the civil rights movement with Brown versus the Board of Education, which is gonna be the Supreme Court case that overturns the separate, separate but equal doctrine of Plessy versus Ferguson. So really the big effects of reconstruction is going to be a loss of political power for African Americans, you know, disenfranchisement methods like poll taxes where you got to pay to vote, literacy tests where you got to like take a freaking test to vote, and then you got the grandfather clause. Like let's say poor whites can't pass the test and they don't have the money to pay for the vote. Well, if their grandpa could vote before the Civil War, then they could vote. Again, a technicality. So really, I mean, Reconstruction was very promising, but thanks to the Redeemer governments, we couldn't really enforce any of these things anymore, like the 14th and 15th Amendments. And with the dissolution of the Freedmen's Bureau, with the withdrawal of the troops in the South, I mean, it's kind of like life went back to how it was, just that now it's a form of legalized slavery with sharecropping and tenant farming. But the violence is there with the KKK. So, sorry to end it on a sad note, guys, but that is Reconstruction. I hope that this resonated with you guys. Um, we will talk more later. Uh, Though I recommend watching The Free State of Jones if you want a good look at Reconstruction. So, alright guys, I will catch you later.